The topic of this video is Depressive and Bipolar Disorders in Psychopathology or Abnormal Psychology. We will begin by defining these various topics. Depression is kind of a low, sad state marked by significant levels of sadness, lack of energy, low self-worth, guilt, or related symptoms. The second item on this list is mania, and that is a state or episode of euphoria or frenzied activity in which people feel that, they, um, that the world is theirs for the taking. A depressive disorder is a group of disorders that are marked by what is known as unipolar depression. Unipolar means depression without a history of mania. Bipolar disorder refers to the disorder that is marked by alternating or intermixed periods of mania and depression. We will elaborate on the various symptoms of depression. The first on this list is emotional symptoms. One might experience feeling miserable, empty, or humiliated, experiencing little pleasure in life. Motivational symptoms might be lacking drive, initiative, and spontaneity in life. Behavioral symptoms refers to when a person is less active and less productive. Cognitive symptoms include that the individual might hold negative views of themselves, they tend to blame themselves for unfortunate events, and they are overall relatively pe pessimistic about life. In some of the physical symptoms, ex those who experience uh, depression might uh, feel headaches, dizzy spells, or general pain. So the symptoms we want to keep in mind might vary from person to person. There are many factors involved like genetics or environment or social interaction. Those are just some examples. So let's talk about unipolar depression. And so uh, the manual that psychologists and psychiatrists use is called the DSM-5-TR. And that lists several types of depressive disorders. The first of those would be major depressive disorder, which is when one experiences a severe pattern of depression that is uh, disabling, and is not caused by such factors as drugs or a general medi medical condition. Persistent depressive disorder refers to a chronic form of unipolar depression marked by depression. And premenstrual dysphoric disorder that's a disorder that is marked by repeated episodes of significant depression and related symptoms during the week before menstruation. When clinicians are diagnosing certain types of depressive disorders, they may uh, come to the conclusion that the, the person is experiencing what they call major depressive episode. So as you can see on this slide, it says for a two week period, the person displays an increase in depressed mood for the majority of each day and or a decrease in enjoyment or interest 
across most daily activities. And for those same two weeks, you know, the person might experience considerable weight change or appetite change. They may experience insomnia or hypersomnia. They may experience daily agitation or decrease in motor activity. They might experience daily fatigue or lethargy. They might experience daily feelings of worthlessness or excessive guilt or a daily reduction in the ability to concentrate or be decisive. The last item on here says repeated focus on death or suicide. And last but not least, it uh, makes pretty good logical sense that those experiencing this disorder, they experience what is known as significant distress or impairment. On the next slide, we will go a little bit further on this. And so major depressive disorder, that is, you know, the presence of a major depressive episode, but there is no pattern of mania or hypomania. On the other hand, persistent depressive disorder, that's when the person experiences uh, those symptoms for at least two years. So during that two year period, their symptoms are not absent for more than two months at a, at a time. But they still experience no history of mania or hypomania, but they do experience significant distress or impairment. On this next slide, we are going to talk about the interaction between stress and unipolar depression. So stressful life events they might precede other psychological disorders, but people who are depressed report more such events than anybody else. On the next slide, we're going to talk about the biological model of unipolar depression, and so that includes genetics or genetic code. So studies of genetic factors, biochemical factors, brain circuits, and the immune system, they all suggest that unipolar depression has biological causes. So I mentioned biochemical, and that's a low activity of two of the important neurotransmitters with Char serotonin, and norepinephrine. And hormones might play a factor in that as well. And hormon hormonal balance and the HPA pathway, the HPA stands for hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So research indicates that the HPA axis of some people with depression is overly reactive in the face of stress, causing excessive releases of cortisol, which is a stress hormone, and related hormones at times of stress. So to summarize on this, stress has a, is a major factor involved in unipolar depression. Going just a bit further, as we are taking a look at the biological model of unipolar depression, well, things like the brain circuits are an important factor in that as well. So researchers believe that the brain circuit involved in unipolar depression includes the prefrontal cortex, 
the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the subgenual cingulate, as well as other structures. And those are all shown on, the, on this slide right here. So those, those all make what we call a brain circuit. And uh, if that brain circuit is dysfunctional, we're able to uh, see that in brain imaging studies. So irregular activity and flow rate in various brain locations, they um, are responsible. They, had, they have a major play in unipolar depression. Going a little bit further, talking about the biological model of unipolar depression is the immune system. So the immune system is the body's network of activities and cells that fight off bacteria and other foreign invaders. So under intense stress, dysregulation of the immune system occurs and contributes to depression. So when a person is stressed, the immune system becomes dysregulated. which results in depression. So what are the some what are some of the biological treatments for unipolar depression? As you can see on this slide, it says antidepressant drugs and there are many different types. There are MAOs or monoamine oxidase there's also what's called tricyclics, second generation antidepressants, and ketamine-based drugs. These are all the different types of treatment from the biological perspective. Then as you can see down below, another type of treatment is what's called brain stimulation. And that includes electroconvulsive therapy, as well as other forms. So usually biological treatment means antidepressant drugs first and foremost. So discussing a little bit further about the uh, antidepressants, you know, there are certain types here we can see right here that some of those antidepressants, they um, inhibit the, uh, the what's called uptake. They block that uptake. And on the right-hand side, that they show that. And those are tricyclic or second-generation antidepressants. And uh, so they block the reuptake of things like norepinephrine and serotonin. On the other hand, there are certain uh, antidepressants. They they support the uptake of serotonin and norepinephrine. And that is on the left-hand side on the screen here. So the MAO inhibitors, they increase the activity level of neurotransmitters serotonin and norepinephrine. On the other hand, things like tricyclics, they block the reuptake of those.
Going a little bit further about the biological treatments for unipolar depression, there is what's known as second generation antidepressants, which I gave some examples here. Feel free to uh, pause the screen and look at this on your own time. Contemporary psychologists and psychiatrists, they have asked, well, how effective are antidepressant drugs really? What they have found though that uh, those who receive the antidepressants as well as uh, psychoactive treatment, they do much better than those who do not receive the uh, psychoactive treatment. Another type of biological treatment for unipolar depression is what's called ketamine-based antidepressants. So they increase the activity of what's called glutamate in the brain, and that may aid new neural pathway development that often alleviates depression very quickly, combines well with other drugs, as well as used to, um, to help those who were previously unresponsive to other drugs. So in this, fo in this photograph right here, this patient is receiving an intravenous uh, in infusion of ketamine under medical super supervision. So as mentioned earlier, what are some of the other biological treatments for unipolar depression, and that is what's called brain stimulation. As you can see, there I listed four methods here. Electroconvulsive therapy, which is um, when electrodes are attached to a patient's head, and then an electrical current is sent through the brain, causing a convulsion. The second method is what's known as vagus nerve stimulation. That's a, a treatment in which an implanted pulse generator sends regular electrical signals to a person's vagus nerve, and then the, that nerve stimulates the brain. On the next slide, I will show you a, uh, an image of that. The third type of method in discussion here is what's called transcranial magnetic stimulation. And that's a treatment in which an electromagnetic coil placed on or above a patient's head sends a current into the individual's brain. The fourth method is what's called deep brain stimulation. So a treatment that works kind of like a pacemaker, it sends electrical signals to the brain to help reduce brain activity to a typical level and recalibrate the depression-related brain circuit. So this is the image that I mentioned in the previous slide. This is the vagus nerve stimulation. It has been shown to reduce depression in many patients. So going further in our discussion about different types of treatment, well, there's what's uh, known as uh, psychological models of unipolar depression and psychodynamic model. 
that began with Sigmund Freud. He said that's when people experience real or even imagined losses. So it's the quality of their thinking that is responsible for their depression. As you can see under supported ideas, it says major losses, especially early life ones, might set the stage for later depression. Poorly met childhood needs are related to depression after loss. This note at the bottom of this slide says research does not really indicate that early loss or problematic relationships are always at the core of depression. So going further in discussion, discussing about psychological models of unipolar depression, well, basic psychodynamic procedures you can see I've got listed here free association. And that's because they believe that unipolar depression results from unconscious grief over real or imagined loss. So the uh, psychologist might, or the uh, clinician might ask them to go ahead and speak freely about everything that they are thinking and feeling. So psychodynamic therapists, you know, they seek to help their clients bring uh, underlying issues to consciousness and then help them work through those. And it's been, uh, it's been known though that short-term psychodynamic therapy has performed better than longer-term approaches especially when they are combined with psychotropic medications. So what are the strengths and limitations about the psychodynamic perspective? Some of the strengths are, you know, that general research has shown that depression might be triggered by major loss and early losses set the stage for later depression. But the limitations, though, many research findings are inconsistent. So early losses and inadequate parenting sometimes lead to depression, but might not be typically responsible for the development of that disorder. Another view that we're going to discuss is what's called the cognitive behavioral view. And that's the view that depression results from problematic behaviors and dysfunctional thinking. So there is a behavioral dimension. There is a thinking, qual you know, qualities of thinking dimension, which is negative thinking. And there is a uh, complex interplay between both of those, the cognitive and behavioral components. So the behavioral dimension is listed here. I gave, there's some examples, you know, that it's been shown there's a large reduction in positive life rewards may cause increasingly fewer positive behaviors even lower positive rewards and eventual depression results. So achieve, receiving social rewards are very important to these clinicians. So there at the bottom of the slide it says, there is a strong relationship between positive life events and feelings of life satisfaction and happiness. 
So participants, you know, who are depressed typically report uh, fewer positive rewards than participants who are not depressed. But when their rewards begin to increase, their mood improves overall as well. Going a little bit further, talking about quality of thoughts, negative thinking has been shown to uh, be an important factor in depression. So negative thinking is a combination of maladaptive attitudes, also what is called the cognitive triad, which we will discuss in just a moment, errors in their thinking, as well as thoughts that occur automatically. As we mentioned earlier, there's a, the cognitive triad. That's a negative view of their experiences, themselves, and their future. So some of the psychological uh, techniques that it, clinicians use is in regard to behavioral activation, they reintroduce uh, pleasurable events and activities to the person experienced the depression. The clinician consistently rewards non-depressive behaviors and withhold rewards for depressive ones. And the clinician also helps clients to improve their social skills. So positive social interaction is very important. There's another model that's used for treatment and to help us understand unipolar depression, and that is called the sociocultural model. And researchers have uh, come to understand that unipolar depression is influenced by our social context and is often triggered by outside stressors, things like family, as well as a multicultural perspective, and that means having to do with uh, one's cultural interactions and success. So let's talk about the family social perspective. So people who are depressed often demonstrate social deficits that may cause avoidance by others thereby decreasing their social contacts and rewards. So depression is tied to weak or unavailable social support, isolation, and lack of intimacy tied repeatedly to troubled or unhappy relationships. And clinical depression is linked to social isolation and imposed social distancing. So some of the methods of treatment employed by clinicians in this respect, they engage in what's called family social treatment or interpersonal psychotherapy. And that includes helping the, uh, the client to understand the nature of their losses, the disputes they might be having, their transitions that they might be experiencing, as well as some of the deficits or things they might be lacking in their relationships. 
And this uh, approach is considered uh, to be especially useful for people who are depressed, who are struggling with social conflicts, or undergoing changes in their careers or their social roles. On the next slide, we will go further. Family social treatments. So that includes couple therapy and uh, behavioral, integrative behavior, behavior couples therapy. Those combine both types of uh, cognitive, behavioral, and socio sociocultural techniques. This is when couples, couples are taught specific communication and problem solving skills. The clinician guides them to recognize that their problematic interactions often reflect basic differences between them and help them to become more accepting and supportive of each other. We will now begin our discussion in regard to bipolar disorders. That involves depression and mania. It often, those who, who uh, have this experience a lot of shift between extreme moods. And it might have a very strong or dramatic impact on their relatives and friends. So on the next slide, we will talk about manic episode. So if for one week or more, a person displays a continuously uh, irregular, inflated, unrestrained, or irritable mood, as well as continually experiencing heightened energy or activity for most days, for at least a week, that is called manic episode. So in diagnosing bipolar disorders, there are two kinds of bipolar disorder. Bipolar 1 and bipolar 2. So bipolar 1 is the person experiences occurrence of, of a manic episode, and they might be hypomanic or major depressive episodes they might proceed or follow the manic episode. Bipolar II disorder is presence or history of major depressive episodes, but they might not experience hypomanic episodes. And there's no history of a manic episode. So some of the symptoms of mania are emotional symptoms, such as being very active, having very powerful emotions in search of an outlet. Some of the motivational symptoms, they might need, they have a need for constant excitement or involvement companionship. Some of the behavioral symptoms is when it might be a person feels very active, they move very quickly, talk loudly or rapidly, very flamboyant. In regard to cognitive symptoms, the individual might show poor judgment or planning. They may have trouble remaining coherent or in touch with reality. Regarding physical symptoms, 
the individual might experience high energy level, often in the presence of little or no rest. So while di diagnosing bipolar disorders, clinicians have found, though, that the onset usually occurs between ages 15 and 44 years. So they have found that without treatment, mood episodes tend to recur for people with either type of bipolar disorder. They experience four or more episodes within a one-year period, and that is classified as rapid cycling. And their depression tends to be experienced more than mania and lasts quite a bit longer. In most cases, though, these manic and depressive episodes, they eventually subside only to recur again at a light, later time. On this next slide, we are going to ask, what causes bipolar disorders? So, the first half of the 20th century, the search for the cause of bipolar disorder, it made very little progress, but due to um, Various, uh, the evolution of psychology, psychiatry, the medical fields. They have found, though, that neurotransmitter activity, ion activity, brain structure, and genetic factors all have a play in bipolar disorder. So I said research into neurotransmitter activity. Well, neuroactivity, neurotransmitter activity, mania may be related to high norepinephrine activity along with a very low level of serotonin activity. In regard to ion activity, they, there's a improper transport of ions back and forth between the outside and the inside of a neuron's membrane. So keep in mind though that ions, they are needed to send incoming messages to the nerve endings. And as a result of being improperly transported through, the, through these cells, that might be responsible for bipolar disorder. In regard to uh, brain structure and circuitry, so brain imagery has shown that there is a number of irregular brain structures in people with bipolar disorder. It is not clear to this day what role such irregularities play. Genetically speaking, the genetic factors, many theorists, theorists believe that people inherit a biological predisposition to develop bipolar disorder. Going further, we're going to answer this question, what are the treatments for bipolar disorders? Well, there are, there's what's known as mood stabilizing drugs, and these drugs might change uh, synaptic activity by operating with the neurons. And that re results in an increased production of brain uh, brain-derived uh, neurotropic factor, which is proteins, and a reduction of bipolar symptoms by improving the functioning of or communications between key structures in the brain.
And this concludes our discussion. Thank you for joining us. Best wishes.